Hello, everyone. This is Mrs. Rawson coming to you from the high school. Actually, I came in today to clear up my classroom. It's very sad being in here. Very, very empty. Um, so we miss all of you. I know I'm just talking to the juniors. Hopefully there are no seniors listening to this since they are done. But um, juniors are almost there and we hope you're doing well and hopefully see you here next year, depending on what all of that will look like. All right, so the topic today, we are performing a hip hypothesis test. Kind of bear with me here. It's going to seem possibly a little confusing at first just because it's some new vocab and concepts, but I'm going to try to really point out the key concepts that will help you guys correctly do your assignment and just try to point out the most important information. Okay, so first, just the concept of what a hypothesis test is. So think about this as what we need to do to perform a hypothesis test. And you'll notice we're, we're going to color code and I'll also have some stars by some of the brown and red information that is most important. And then in your last lesson, um, a lesson 11, we'll look at correctly interpreting the information. Okay, so first just think about if you have a coin with two sides, heads and tails, we obviously know that's a 50-50 chance, so equal probability. So you start looking at your results and we're seeing heads every time so far. We continue and you can see here, at one point do we start questioning the claim that it is a fair coin? So starting to question it because we're getting heads every single time. All right, so 1,000 flips, 1,000 heads, zero tails. So based on this, is it reasonable to believe that my claim was that it was a fair coin? And our question is, at what point what do we call for skepticism and how can we use probability to help us figure that out? So here you can kind of just see in a chart example to look at that probability. So again, it just does not seem reasonable based on that data. So here is ways that we can actually determine if the claim is true or not. So here's your basic idea. So we always just start by assuming something to be true. Then we take data and we calculate the likelihood of it occurring. And notice we have to use the data that we already have, not what we might get. And we're going to provide data for you in these examples. So then if our data, data is reasonable given our assumption, then we just keep with our assumption. But if it is sufficiently unlikely, that is when we conclude that our assumption was incorrect and the opposite must be true instead. Again, we're kind of just starting general, so just try to so again, some of these concepts. Okay, so here's an example. So we're saying a tire manufacturer claims that the mean lifespan for their tires is at least 34,000 miles. So now we have a research team that's giving us data. They sample 91 tires. The mean of that sample is 31,500 miles and the standard deviation is 4,000 miles. So we need to figure out, is that enough evidence to reject the manufacturer's claim? All right, so here's our two possible conclusions. The manufacturer claimed that the mean lifespan for their tires was at least 34,000 miles. So notice here we're putting it into inequalities. So mean greater than or equal to 34,000. So the sample results say that the equal 31,500, which contradict that claim. So there's two possible explanations. The claim could still be true, just our sample mean happens to be a little lower, or the claim is false and the sample's mean is so low that the most reasonable explanation is that the claim is false. So let's use probability to officially determine our solution. Okay, so a little more vocab here. Notice all these little stars right here and the red and the brown. So write this down, take a picture, whatever you need to do, because this will help you guys with your assignment. 
So this HO, that's our null hypothesis, that is what we are assuming to be true. So we call it the null hypothesis, assuming it to be true. Because we just trust that it's true, it's common convention, being cautiously skeptic, skeptic about it all. Um, it's just the best accepted practice at the time and it suits our purposes. All right, so then this HA here, that is your alternate hypothesis. That is always the complement, which if you guys remember in terms of probability stuff, the complement means opposite. So alternate hypothesis is always the opposite of the null hypothesis. Okay, so now let's put it in terms of our example. So we're assuming that the manufacturer claim is true because that is how we start these off. And now we're just going to try to disprove it since our sample results contradict it. All right, so here is your null hypothesis. We're claiming that the mean is greater than or equal to 34,000. Then remember, alternate hypothesis is the opposite. So that means alternate hypothesis is that the mean is less than 34,000. And again, we know that our sample results support the alternate hypothesis. We just need to know whether that support is strong enough. And that's what we're going to look at how you actually figure that out. Okay, so again, just remember here, we always begin by assuming the null hypothesis is true. All right, here, here's your reminder of the data that we are given. And if our sample is sufficiently unlikely, we conclude that our null hypothesis cannot be true. And the opposite would be true instead. Okay, so a little bit more vocab, and then we're going to go to looking at how we can finally determine if our null hypothesis is true. So here is significance level, and notice that's in red here. We need to remember this. That's alpha. So the significance level is how unusual our sample needs to be. So you'll be given, ask that information. So usually we use 5%, 2%, or 1%. Then the p-value, that is the probability that our sample occurs given that the null hypothesis is true. The calculator will find the p-value for us. So we're going to look at that in a sec. All right, very, report, very important. It is red. There's stars. It says you wrote that down, right? So again, this should be a nice, easy question when you see this on your assignment. But here is what happens. We reject the null when the p-value is less than alpha. So when the p-value is less than the significance level, we reject the null. We fail to reject the null when the p-value is greater than or equal to alpha. So you need to know this part here when I'm highlighting. You'll have a couple questions dealing with that. So again, p-value needs to be less than alpha to reject the null. Okay, so I know this might seem kind of redundant, but we're just trying to help you guys break this down, and then we're going to look at how we put it in the calculator. All right, so we've got null hypothesis alternate hypothesis, and then there's our mean standard deviation in sample size. We never set a significance level, so let's just say 5%, which remember here, always think of it in terms of a decimal. So 0 0.05, we're going to say is alpha. All right, so now we just need to find the p-value. We will do that in the calculator. All right, so in your calculator, you're going to press the stat button and arrow over to tests. You can pause the screen here if you want to follow this. I'm also going to bring um, my calculator up. So we're going to do stat and then tests. So I'm going to pull that up for a sec. So here's our stat button. Arrow over to tests. And then notice we are doing number two, the t-test. I'll go back to the PowerPoint for a sec so you guys could see that. So here's your screen, just like what I had up. And just like confidence intervals that we finished up with, you can use data or enter sample stats directly. Here we're just entering the stats. So arrow over to stats and press that. So I'll do that here. So I already have stats highlighted, but then press enter.
All right, now here I have my numbers in, but I'm gonna go to our next screen so you guys can see where you put everything. So again, you can pause the screen for a sec and be doing this in your calculator to make sure you see how to get them. But notice everything is labeled. You have your mean, the S here is your standard deviation and is the sample size. So those three should be pretty easy to put in. And then the extra part here, notice that you're putting the alternate hypothesis in. So pay close attention to what we need to change here. So for the alternate hypothesis, that's this little symbol up here where you see we put in the 34,000. And really important then when you see this little space here right before calculate, because the alternate hypothesis is that the mean is less, then we have to highlight the less than symbol. So it's really just that alternate hypothesis that you want to be careful about how you input that. All right, then you arrow down to calculate. So I'm going to go to my calculator here. Notice I have all those numbers in. So I'm going to arrow down to calculate and press enter. And we want to look right here at the P value. And if you guys remember, anytime you see that E negative 8, Remember, that is um, just saying that it means 2.4 times 10 to the negative 8. So as you guys can see right here, 2.4 times 10 to the negative 8, which remember, when we put it in decimal format, that's a really, really small number. So this is saying if the null hypothesis is true, this is the probability a sample like ours will occur. All right, so let's look at answering this here. This p-value, this point zero 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 zero, I lost track counting, but you know what I mean, 2, 4, it is less than our significance level. If you remember, we set that as 0 0.05. When that happens, that means we reject the null, concluding that our null hypothesis is false and the alternate hypothesis is true which we maybe could have already determined, but as you guys have hopefully figured out by now, we need to use evidence to support it. So that's where this p-value comes in. In your last lesson, lesson 11, that you guys will have later this week, we'll talk more about interpreting this conclusion. But right now we're trying to just to focus on the main idea. Okay, so here again, this will help you with one of your questions on your assignment. You have three scenarios. So you're Null hypothesis will either be greater than or equal to a number, which means the alternate is less than that number, or null hypothesis will be less than or equal to a number, which means alternate hypothesis is greater than that number, or null hypothesis will just be equal to a number, which means alternate would not equal that number. So notice your stars here. Note that in all cases, the null hypothesis uses equals in some form. So the null hypothesis has to have equal in some form, whether it's greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, or just equals. Okay, that will come into play on your assignment. Okay, so here's another example just to help you understand. So now we're looking at a company's employees claim that they get paid less on average than the employees at a competing company. So the employees at that company make a mean salary of $45,000. We have a sample of 47 employees, mean salary of 44,250, standard deviation of 5,200. And we're gonna use a 5% significance level again. Okay, so let's break this down. So write your hypothesis. So the claim is that the mean is less than 45,000 because they're claiming that they get paid less. So the claim is less than 45,000. So the question is, is that claim the null or the alternate hypothesis? Remember what we just said here, the null hypothesis always uses some form of equals. So that means the claim for this example is actually the alternate hypothesis. So just keep in mind, you don't have to take the claim and always make it the null hypothesis. You have to look at, is it using an equal sign at all? 
If it's not, use it as the alternate hypothesis instead. So the claim is the alternate hypothesis, which means the null hypothesis is the opposite. So null hypothesis is that the mean is greater than or equal to 45,000. It's so really important here to notice. Just always go by, take your claim. If there's no equal with it, then the claim is actually the alternate hypothesis. All right, so here's our data. So we're going to start by assuming that the opposite of the claim is true, because remember, the opposite is the null. We always assume that the null hypothesis is true to start it off. Okay, so we have our significance level 0 0.05, so let's go back to the calculator. So remember again, the mean standard deviation and sample size should always be really easy of knowing how to input because they're labeled pretty easily there. Then just always remember you are putting the alternate hypothesis in for this mean. So you put your 45,000 in right here. And then again, because we're saying that it is less than 45,000, make sure the less than symbol is highlighted. So if you're following along trying to do this in your calculator, make sure you type all those numbers in. When you press calculate, here we get our p-value. Notice you want to round that to four decimal places here. The other one, we went further just because it was such a tiny, tiny number. But if it's just a decimal like this, go ahead and round it to four places. Okay, so remember what we starred a couple slides ago. The p-value is larger than alpha this time. So remember, when p is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null. Whoops, I'll go back. Okay, so that means we can't say that the null is false or that the alternate is true. It just means our sample doesn't support our claim strongly enough. And note here that failing to reject the null is much weaker statement than just saying we reject it, but we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so I know that might have seemed like a lot of stuff, but here's just a quick little summary. So we use sample data to make and judge claims about a population. We always know that your age zero is your um, null hypothesis, which always is what we start off assuming to be true. And then your HA, that is your opposite statement. That is what we're trying to prove true. Remember, that's your alternate hypothesis. So you take your sample result, you calculate that probability, and then remember in your calculator, that gives you the p-value. Then that last set there, we reject the null. So we end up saying the alternate one is true. If the p-value is less, than the significance level. Remember, that's alpha. So hopefully, even if this maybe seemed a little like a lot, hopefully just pointing out and starring some of the main things in here will help you guys make sense of the assignment. You will have to do that um, p-value in your calculator once on the assignment, and you will see a couple more questions asking you about p-values. So Good luck on that. You're almost there. Hope you guys are having a great day and we will talk to you soon.